going to talk about vectorization. Now this is uh, interesting because when I was working with uh, folks in digital an animation at uh, DreamWorks, Animation, Pixar, so forth, one of the things that's interesting is we put a book out and you won't find vectorization in here anywhere, um, which uh, gives you pause for thought. It was, um, why is that? Well, because in general, parallelizing an application is more important than vectorizing. Now, the challenge is, though, if you're in HPC, uh, you're not going to give up performance anywhere. And uh, vectorizations become too important to ignore. Now, it hasn't always been that way. Um, I mean, it's kind of gone back and forth. The early days of Cray vector supercomputers, vectorization was everything. Um, and then microprocessors and massively parallel computers took over and actually didn't have much in line of vectorization, not much advantage. And that went on for quite a while, but uh, if you look at the history of microprocessors, the vector instructions have become increasingly important. And when we get to the Xeon Phi family from Intel, 512-bit wide capabilities, meaning 16 single precision or eight double precision uh, floating points per instruction, it, it's just too much to ignore. And it has an extremely important, big value. But you should never get confused if you're teaching parallel computing, uh, if you have to pick between doing parallelization and uh, uh, vectorization, uh, parallelization is more important in a perspective of uh, how many cores you have is scaling up. Uh, I mean, you can get a 72x speed up ideally from 72 cores, but you can only get a 16x speed up from vectorization. Now, so, so that's why uh, you do that. But, you know, if you, you, uh, if you do both, it's pretty impressive. Now, there's an urban legend that Albert Einstein once said that uh, uh, compound interest was the greatest force in the universe. Well, I can kind of... Uh, graph it this way in terms of vectorization and uh, parallelization. If we, uh, uh, we can parallelize and get maybe a 72x speed up and we can vectorize and get 16x, but the, uh, uh, or I did, I guess I did 244, which is, uh, uh, is 60, 61 times uh, four. This was uh, for Knight's Corner. I should update this for Knight's Landing. but. Uh, you can see that the power of both, the theoretical speed up, is huge. And this, this, this math is pretty simple, but I think a lot of times we don't pause to think, you know, wow, I can only get 16x from vectorization, I can only get 72x from using every core, or if I used each thread, maybe I get more than that. But uh, when you multiply the two together, they're, they're explosive. So um, Sometimes I get asked, can we ignore vectorization? And I said, uh, for an HPC crowd, the answer is no. If you ignore it, you're giving up way too much performance uh, in general. So now I'll take it a step further. I think we've gotten to the point now, and this will be a strong theme in how I explain vectorization. We've gotten to the point where we really need to do explicit vectorization. And for a variety of reasons. One is the programmer needs to be a bit involved in giving a direction that you've really written the code to be vectorized. The other thing is, is it actually makes the code more uh, portable, more performance portable. And I think that'll come out as I explain my thinking. Vectorization has been a fact of life with CPU programming for a long time as the different instructions got introduced. And I think if you, if you uh, cut your teeth on programming with a CPU and you get into vectorization, you, you view it as a fact of life. Uh, unfortunately, if you come at it from a GPU standpoint, a lot of times vectorization is frustrating to people that have been doing GPU programming because you, in GPU you tend to think of kernel programming, you think of a single operation, and duplicating it in a GPU um, seems simpler. Um, the funny thing is, is it's, it's uh, it is simpler from that viewpoint because the, when you get a kernel operation, you're pretty constrained on what you can do, but you can always uh, do that in parallel. Um, what you kind of don't see is that you've already been constrained in a problem that made it easy. 
The problem with CPU programming is you're totally unconstrained, and now I'm going to tell you how to constrain your problem so it vectorizes well. Um, and in my experience, now in, in, when I worked at Intel, a lot of people would say, oh, GPU programming is hard. And I go, well, I actually, my opinion is GPU programming can seem really easy when it's taught a certain way, especially because you teach the basics and you grow from there. As opposed to CPU programming, you can do anything you want, but now I have to teach you how to constrain your programming so you get good vectorization. You know, honestly, I think they're both equivalent in the difficulty to learn. It's just that you, you need to observe that you're coming at it from different angles. So when I talk about getting things to vectorize on a CPU, I'm telling us, I'm explaining how to, how to write your program in a, way, a, a, a manner that will vectorize well. So I'm constraining you in programming, whereas if I start you off teaching you GPU programming with CUDA, I've already constrained you um, because CUDA is pretty constraining but it's beautifully constrained to be ready to vectorize on a GPU. Um, so I will talk about this from a CPU standpoint. And um, <clears throat> honestly, there's not gonna be a magical compiler that vectorizes stuff. Again, the problem is <clears throat> the C, C++, Fortran, COBOL, Java, pick your programming language for a CPU. None of them were designed to be parallel programming languages. They, they really just aren't. And so what you have is a programming language where you can do anything in and you want the compiler to magically make things run in parallel or vectorize, which is a different type of parallelism. Um, and the answer is that's too hard of a problem because the compiler's first job is to produce correct code. And if you've got a program that can theoretically do all sorts of wild things, it's not okay for the compiler to say, ah, oh, they probably didn't mean that. I'm just going to assume they want it to run in parallel. One of the biggest ones is in the C language, pointers can be aliased. So I can have two pointers and they can both point to the same array uh, or they can point to different parts of the same array. In, in, in Fortran, that's il actually illegal for uh, parameters to be aliased. It has been since the language was defined in 1956. So if you ever hear a compiler writer saying Fortran's a better language for vectorization, that's why you can get around it in the C language by adding restrict keywords. Uh, you can get around it in C++ by using the C restrict keywords even though it's not in the C++ language because the compilers usually will accept it with the right flags. But you have to do something. And so don't ignore vectorization. Don't expect a magic compiler. Um, but you know, the key here is vector instruction should make things faster. Theoretically, SSE, which is 128 bits wide, if you move to AVX, uh, which is 256 bits wide, theoretically, uh, if you're CPU bound, uh, you uh, can get twice the performance. AVX 512, you can get 4x the performance. Um, if you're bandwidth bound, uh, or to the degree that you're bandwidth bound, this will uh, this will change. This can change. Uh, if you're if you're totally bandwidth bound and not CPU bound, the SSE instructions may run full speed. Uh, but programs rarely that are doing this rarely are that uh, bandwidth bound. Um, and so usually the number of instructions you're using will help. And you know if there's lots and lots of benchmarks showing, you know, different speed ups uh, using uh, AVX. But anyways. Um, let me back up and make sure I explain what a vector is. Um, and I'm sorry, I, I, I expect that most of you think you know what a vector is, but I don't want to uh, uh, be, con, you know, be a, assuming, because it's really important to have a good vi uh, picture in your mind. A vector is just a vector of numbers. Uh, nothing more, nothing less. And a vector addition is just a pairwise addition. This is part of the reason that the hardware can implement this so fast is the hardware can add two numbers together and give you an answer. It can also have, we can also arrange 16 adders in a row and do 16 additions and produce 16 answers. There's no cross play between these. There's no uh, one addition doesn't affect the other. Um, and uh, what's surprising to some people who haven't, who hear about this first time is vector multiplications the same way. There's no, this isn't a, a cross product or anything. This is just pairwise multiplication. So we put 16 floating point multipliers. Uh, I think I put 11 on here just to be, or 10, 
uh, no, I got 11, just to make sure it didn't match any particular hardware, but the, um, uh, this is what a vector multiplication is. So the, the game here for us when we're programming is we would like the compiler to take a loop like this and vectorize it, right? I'm, I want to take uh, a bunch of elements of A, add them to B, and put them in C. Now, the, the way that a normal, applica normal assembly code would work, these are the instructions the machine would actually operate is, we would load something from A sub I, we would load B sub I, we would add them together, creating a result, and then we'd store it back to C sub I, and we'd increment by one and loop back. These are the, this is what the machine will actually do. We would actually have this sequence of instructions emitted by the compiler. All vectorization means to a compiler is, I want you to generate vector instructions. All a vector instruction is is one that can do multiple things at once. In this case, let's uh, do four at a time. So now we load four elements of A into a vector register that, by the way, can hold four elements. We load four elements of B. We do four additions and we store four back and then we increment by four. Um, great, that's what vectorization means to a compiler. So how do we get the compiler for the loop that I was showing, instead of emitting these instructions, emit those, because those instructions run roughly four times as fast, because we're doing four um, things at a time. We're loading four times as much data at a time, we're storing four times as much, we're adding four times as much. Now, this is vectorization. Now, there's one little challenge. This loop's not legal to vectorize. The vectorization code I showed you changes the meaning of the program. And this is the stuff that starts to drive you nuts as a programmer, is trying to figure out why is the compiler not vectorizing my code? And the reason is A sub i and B sub i are not necessarily in different places of memory than C sub i. And if you wrap your head around that, you start to realize every time I write C, an element into C, I may have changed an element of A or B. And I wrote the original program saying do this one at a time. The compiler needs to take that completely literally. The compiler cannot assume. And uh, now you could say, why doesn't the compiler produce two versions of the loop? And the short answer is if the compiler does that for every section of loop it suspects might vectorize, uh, you get a code explosion and uh, you kill your iCache performance and you increase your binary size and you cr increase your load time and all sorts of horrible things that users complain about and so compilers don't do that. So how do we get, how do we fix a loop like this? I think this is, I'll illustrate how I think about when I'm looking at something that doesn't vectorize, what are the different things I could do? And uh, one is <clears throat> you could just throw a switch in the compiler and say, try to vectorize. Well, unfortunately in that particular loop, it won't vectorize it because it knows it changes the meaning of the program. Uh, another is you could try to give it some hints. Now, it turns out one critical hint here is using the restrict keyword. This is basically telling the compiler that your C program will behave like every good Fortran program would, that you will not alias your parameters. This means that A, B, and C are arrays that are distinct. So when I write C, I'm not changing A or B. If you add these keywords to your program and ask uh, a compiler to vectorize it, uh, I know for a fact the Intel compiler will vectorize this. Uh, I suspect so will every other vectorizing compiler. This is a pretty easy one. The compiler looks at it and says, oh yeah, they're totally independent. I'm not worried, I'll vectorize it. That's one way. There's another directive called IV depth. And as a compiler writer, this makes total sense to me. It means um, to ignore uh, loop, uh, implied loop carried dependencies. You know, that, that's uh, compiler speak that uh, I don't really want to try to uh, spend a lot of time explaining to application developers what uh, implied loop carry dependencies are. Um, now there's some great PhDs written in the 80s about loop dependencies. Uh, 
Uh, one of them that I loved and read was by a gentleman named Michael Wolf, who works for uh, PGI or NVIDIA now. Uh, but Michael Wolf's a longtime friend. I took a class from him on loop carry dependencies, entire semester studying what these dependencies are and how they affect compilers, disambiguation, and so forth. That pragma tells the compiler to get over its worries, but it's not written in what I would call English. It's not very, uh, I, and, and by the way, sometimes you can put that directive in front of a loop and it still doesn't vectorize. And I could look at it and look at some compiler dumps and say, yeah, of course, uh, your problem wasn't an implied loop carry dependence, it was some other type of dependence. But anyways, IV depth has been in compilers uh, because compiler writers said, oh, this is pretty easy. I can put it in there and then I can run over the graph real quick and prune out those type of dependencies and see uh, what happens. But um, it's not the easiest thing to teach. Now, the way that people use IV depth, in my experience, is they put it in and see if their program vectorizes and if it still works. Um, I, I have known very few people, even people that know compilers as well as I do, very few people uh, study it hard enough to be really sure that this is the right directive. They just stick it in and see if the program um, speeds up. Well, this is not supported by all compilers. Uh, so this strange idea came up of mandatory vectorization. And uh, I have told many audiences, uh, when I first saw this idea, I thought it was the stupidest idea I ever saw. It scared me. I thought, really? You're going to let the users have a directive that says you must vectorize this loop no matter what? And the reason I didn't like that was, <laughs> what if it's wrong? Well, what I underestimated was the frustration at getting loops to vectorize because the game before this was, let's keep trying to tell the compiler what it wants to hear so it'll vectorize my loop. The new directive is vectorize it. And then you debug your program after you find out that that wasn't the right thing to do. Um, and so OpenMP added this. Uh, this was in the Intel compilers uh, starting about five or six years ago. And it was so popular and we got so much data from users uh, that we proposed it to the OpenMP committee and everybody jumped on it. Um, I even remember there was an NVIDIA rep that really liked it because this will help compilers uh, vectorize for GPUs as well because it, what it says is vectorize the loop. I've thought about it, I know what I'm doing, I know that it can change the, the uh, semantics of the program slightly, you know, like the alias parameters, but just assume I know what I'm doing. And it's funny because if you make a mistake, like your program actually won't work when it's vectorized, you can stick this in and then debug it and find out what mistake you made as a programmer by using this. Um, and uh, <laughs> I would say that most programmers that, I, that I've spoken with find that preferable. However, there is a small camp of people who hate this directive, and I get to hear about it sometimes, and they, they will chew me out in the hallways and say that it's a horrible directive because it breaks programs. Um, and then there's a big fan club. So uh, I have changed my opinion on it, my personal opinion, and this is a wonderful directive because it, it says you must vectorize this loop and then you can go debug whether your program still works or not. If you use it properly in a loop that should vectorize and that where your intent was, uh, that you intended it to vectorize, you can get back, get past a whole lot of crud at trying to figure out uh, why the compiler wasn't vectorizing it. Now, there's some additional features in OpenMP standard, uh, like declaring a function to be vectorizable. And what this does is uh, it tells the compiler that it might be a good idea to build a vector version of this function. And it has two effects. One, if you have a more complex function than this, it means it may pass in four things at a time, compute them, and come out with four answers. Um, on a simple thing like this, my expectation is it'll produce a vector version of it, but then it'll inline it. And, uh, and depending on the compiler, it may have inlined and vectorized automatically anyways, 
uh, in this case, it may have worried about aliasing and the compiler may have gotten confused. But this will override, this is very similar to a kernel function in CUDA. It's very, very similar uh, if you're familiar with CUDA. Uh, now, there are other things you can do to vectorize code. One of them is uh, use intrinsics. So, back in the late 90s, we introduced SSE at Intel, from Intel, and MMX had been out there, but the only way people really programmed MMX was in assembly language. And they would do assembly language using uh, something like MASM, uh, or they would use uh, 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 inline assembly in the compiler. And uh, what we did is introduce the concept of intrinsics. They look like a function call, but their name actually maps directly, in most cases, to a single instruction in the instruction set. So if, if you actually learn the different instructions, this is, a, is an add instruction that takes two packed singles, packed single precision numbers, and uh, it, um, uh, it'll add two and create two, and then you've got some data. Anyways, this is all, uh, this is SSE code using 128 bit wide formats, and there's versions for 256 and 512. I usually say don't use these because the code's not real portable. Like this code will produce SSE instructions. Even on Knight's Landing, it has to produce SSE because that's actually what I wrote. Um, and so if I want to change it for Knight's Landing, I need to go in and change a few letters there and change the 128s to 512s and, and uh, produce my own uh, uh, AVX 512 version. Uh, but this gives you an extreme amount of control. And if you have one little kernel and you want to do tricky things, so, um, I usually kind of brush over intrinsics and don't talk about them much, even though I had a, a lot to do with them existing in the Intel compiler. In fact, I'm the one that decided that they should be listed with the instructions in the instruction manual for the instruction set. So you'll see, in, if you get Intel's instruction manual out, not only does it show you the name of the instruction assembly language, it shows you the intrinsic name. Um, and uh, that has helped us standardize it across all compilers. That was my idea. If we would publish from Intel a name, maybe everyone would use it. And it turned out it worked out. So GNU and Intel and uh, uh, PGI and everybody use the same name. Um, but uh, I gave in and I wrote a chapter, I think it's chapter 12 in the book, on using AVX 512 intrinsics on Knight's Landing. And I show an example of a typical example of where uh, cleverness with this may exceed the compiler's cleverness. What it is, is, is an example that uses some complex numbers and it's doing some multiplication. And multiplication of complex numbers uh, involves some interesting additions and, and products across. And the compiler wasn't smart enough to load the numbers and then swizzle them. It was loading them one at a time. And it turns out if I could load them into the registers and then swap around parts of them, I could do a set of uh, different math operations and come up with the answers for a set of uh, three complex numbers uh, and pack them in. Anyways, uh, it's a lovely example that an engineer at Intel had done in a, uh, in a code, and then um, I sat down with them and we figured out how to explain it in a chapter. Um, so if you, if you want to see an example of using intrinsics and why you might consider it, if if you've got in your head that it ought to vectorize, but your compiler's not clever enough, um, but it needs to be something like complex numbers swizzling around. Now, of course, the Intel compiler group, having read the chapter, is running around saying, oh, we can teach the compiler to do that. So my chapter will probably be invalid in a year as an example, but uh, let your imagination be inspired by that. If you're doing something really interesting with numbers, moving them around, and then you can arrange them so that vector instructions can help you, but you know it doesn't write really cleanly in C or Fortran, uh, and the compiler doesn't vectorize it, you might use intrinsics. Again, the problem with them is they don't port well, but if it's only one or two functions you're doing in this, it might be worthwhile. Now there have been things like Fortran 90 has array descriptors or the Intel compiler and the GNU compiler support an extension ca uh, called Silk Plus arrays uh, where you can say, here's a, a slice of an array, I want to use it. 
These do not work very well because the type of programs that people use tend to rush through arrays and then rush through arrays again and again. You're actually better off iterating through and operating on smaller parts because of the caches. Um, so when we see people use these, they tend to do them on big arrays and it blows out cache and then they do it again on the array and it blows the cache out again and they wonder why their performance is bad. And the compiler guys say, oh, you should use short vectors, which is instead of going zero to max, go zero to i and do i and, and do a loop around it and i and iterate and, uh, and when you do that, the, this type of coding doesn't even uh, make sense to me anymore. So anyways, those are some things you can do. You can ask the compiler politely to try to vectorize the code, but you're gonna run up against the fact that your language is inherently sequential. Um, you can give it some hints and cross your fingers and hope that the compiler hints you give are enough for it to feel good about vectorizing. Or you can just get in there and say, vectorize it, just do it, and then debug it from there. That's how I like to think about it. And so the, I think the vectorize, I think the Pragma SIMD I, I, well, o, the uh, Pragma OMP SIMD now um, is a very powerful way to get stuff to vectorize. Now there's an incredible tool from Intel called uh, Advisor, and it has a vector advisor in it that's a couple years old now. And the 2017 version that's in beta now has added some more features, and it's, it's uh, trying to analyze your code and how it's running and give you feedback about what, what's not vectorizing, what you might change to make it vectorize and so forth. So I highly recommend that tool. And that's a good segue to me talking about uh, uh, different tools. I can say that vectorization is gonna continue going for quite a bit. It's, um, you can see the growth and the, and the width. I think it'll be a while before Intel goes to 1024 because 512 is a cache line, and uh, uh, going beyond that has interesting cache line interplays, unless they make a cache line longer, which has other issues. So uh, I suspect 512 will be up it for a while, but if you look at the encodings carefully, it's pretty easy to imagine how Intel could extend it to 124. Uh, I think the big question is what do you do about the fact that you're uh, your vector registers will be longer than a cache line. Um, but if you take a look at the instruction growth in x86 from Intel, um, this is <laughs> um, my, my count. Uh, this can start a fight in Intel too about how do you, which instructions are vector, which aren't. But by my uh, counting, and uh, these are different Xeon processors. They're purposely not labeled so they don't get in too much trouble, but they're you know starting back. But, this would be uh, one of the latest ones. And the number of vector instructions uh, in the instruction set, is the, it's the place that the instructions are growing, including things like conflict detection. Uh, this is an interesting one where you have an access to an element like A sub B sub I. How do you vectorize that? You don't know if sequential B sub I's might be pointing to the same memory location. There's actually an instruction in Knight's Landing that can take uh, a vector of B sub I's and in hardware very quickly analyze where the first conflict is. And instead of doing 16 vector oper, it'll only do all 16 if there's no conflict. If there's a conflict, it'll do a certain number of them, as many as it can, do them, leave a number in a register that can be used to shift things and start uh, again. Uh, where the conflict was. And the reason this is really powerful is the compiler, when it uses it, most of the time it turns out code doesn't have this conflict. So most of the time the code runs vectorized. And occasionally at runtime when there is a conflict, it, it just does a few less um, um, operations in that cycle and picks up where it left off and goes. This is the type of instructions that are getting added, and this is part of the reason that vectorization gets better and better in processors and compilers. It's not that the compilers are just getting smarter, it's that the hardware is giving some new instructions that interplay with the compiler's vectorization to make it possible to vectorize loops that the compiler would not have vectorized before. Um, so that is something to keep in mind, because code that didn't vectorize five years ago may vectorize today uh, if you try it, 
uh, because of a combination of new instructions and new compiler technology. It's a moving target. And there's lots of vector reports. Um, and I, I, I love pouring through these. Uh, they, they're, um, if I'm trying to figure out why something didn't vectorize, but uh, if you uh, like GUIs, uh, the vector advisor is a great way to go as well. Um, and it does a very similar thing using the vector reports uh, with a little bit of augmentation. So I want to leave you with a simple thought about performance tuning. And the thought is that performance tuning tools are your friends. Um, there is more in the world than printf, even though printf is my favorite debugging tool. Um, and what I look for when I'm doing tuning is, is surprises. So the best way to performance tune is to have some idea of what performance you think you should be getting and, uh, and why, and then to use a tool to see what matches your impressions and what doesn't. First of all, it's hard to, to see anything if you don't look. Um, but I see a lot of people guess where a problem is. And guessing is great if you have a tool to go verify it efficiently. What um, amazes me is how often we as programmers will go guess and recode that part of the program, and then when it doesn't speed up, it adds to our frustration. And then we're sure we know the answer, we go recode that, and it doesn't work, and that. So I find it more productive. Now this is, this is me saying, do what I say, not what I do, because I do that recoding thing a lot, because I'm really sure of myself, but it's, um, I get frustrated. Um, if you have a theory or you have an idea, then try to go see if some tools can show you what's really going on. Now in the old days, we used to have blinky lights on the front of the computer that told us a lot. And the blinky lights don't tell you much anymore. They tell you the power is turned on um, because there's so much on a node. Um, so the, there are tools that can really help. Um, and you look to confirm that things are working the way you want. So if you have an idea how things should be working, wh what should the performance of this section be or what should the output? And the other is surprises. If something isn't what you expect, then that's the tip of the iceberg. That's the hint to go debug what's going on. And as time goes on, you grow expertise. So now, the other thing I'll say is be patient about making sure, if you're trying to make a program run faster, make sure you're doing it uh, from the top level down. Don't, don't do uh, system tuning uh, last in general. In other words, uh, if there's things you can affect at a macro level, do that before you get to the micro tuning. Um, and this is a disease I suffer from because I, I often get excited about uh, optimizing a kernel of my program before I look at the overall program. And uh, that, if the program's very mature, that might be a good way to do it. But understanding the program holistically and what holistic rearranging, there's often better performance to be gained from that. Um, in any case, the, uh, you know, there's a lot of tools to do application tuning um, and look at it, but ultimately we get down to hot spots usually. This is, uh, you know, the, see, see how I skipped across the holistic program you know, adjustments. I, I tell you to do that and then I want to talk about micro-tuning. Um, but that's my, you know, always my specialty I get into is how can I look at a section of the code and make it uh, perform faster? Uh, and you usually get into hot spot analysis. And this is where if you have some notion of how your program's distribution should be, like you think that it should be spending most of its time here, but then you find out it's spending most of its time here, that can be a hint. And before you rush in to adjust that, um, take a few moments to think about why you were wrong. What, why did it surprise you? Because sometimes the, the, the symptom tells you more than just that you should go work on that part of the program. Why did, you, why did your assumptions about uh, where the program would be spending its time are wrong? There are so many tools that can help you with this. You know, O-Profile and SysProf and Intel's VTune. 
which is a favorite of mine, partially because I grew up with it from the very first versions of it. Uh, it's a, it can be a, a little overwhelming at times, but it's got a lot of good data. It's very, very accurate. Uh, and the processors from Intel have grown up along with it, meaning that uh, the VTune developers have caused the chip architects to put features in the, uh, the chip, um, specifically because we thought it would make VTune better. One of my favorites is there's something called stall accounting, um, a very unknown feature by most people. But uh, imagine this. You could go say, hey, I want to figure out where all the cache misses are happening because I think reducing cache misses will make my program run faster. Mm, that's a very misleading thing. You don't really want to reduce cache misses. You want to reduce stalls caused by cache misses. Well, it turns out it was really easy to count cache misses, but what you didn't know was how often did the uh, out of order execution engine, the rearranging code, hide the cache miss? Because you can go get rid of cache misses that were being hidden, but you weren't stalling anything and your program doesn't get faster. Oh, that's frustrating. <laughs> um, but it turns out if you can actually ask the system uh, to count stalls that are happening because there was an outstanding cache miss and no forward progress could happen until that was satisfied, that would tell you places where if you could rearrange your code that it would speed it up. Now that's a pretty sophisticated use of VTune, but all of Intel's modern processors support stall accounting and VTune knows how to program them. Um, some of the tools like uh, O-Profile and stuff do not know how to program stall accounting in the processors yet. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated to tell the processor I only want to count cache misses when it causes a stall. But that sophistication is built into the hardware and VTune can get it. So it's worth learning these performance tools and a little bit more about what they can do. Stall accounting is probably my best hint because you might, you know, you, it's very easy to get excited about reducing cache misses, but when you really think about it, that's not what you, that, that won't speed up your program necessarily. Um, so I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of benefit in looking at uh, tools. Um, you can look at uh, things like are you memory bound, process bound, uh, is the application running in parallel? Again, these, are, these sound really simple, but don't forget to look at simple things. Like you can get some really incredible graphs that'll show how well utilized different cores are on your node. Or you can use an MPI tool to show you how well balanced uh, are you across your MPI application. By the way, getting a program to be balanced and not waiting um, and not being unbalanced um, can really add to the performance of an application. You may have to use your brain a bit to figure out why are you unbalanced or why are you stalling so much? How do you get rid of barriers that are causing delays? Uh, but these are, these are the things to look for in the tool um, because ideally you're trying to get an application that's beautiful. It, it keeps every node busy. Uh, you're never waiting on any communication on MPI. You're never waiting for a barrier or very little time. And it's really surprising when you look at real applications sometimes, the massive amounts of delays that are causing processors to sit idle um, or no, whole nodes to sit idle. Those are um, worth looking at. And so this is like a graph from uh, the MPI tool. And you know we use a really sophisticated coloring scheme. Red is bad. Um, and so for, you know, the, the red is stalls. Uh, it's places where nodes on the system are waiting. And this is from the, the uh, MPI, well, I call it MPI thing. It's Trace Analyzer and Collector is the official Intel name. Let me just highlight a few last things that are in the current beta. And the reason I'll highlight these is um, to kind of highlight some of the thinking the Intel team has right now about some of the performance tuning tools they can add. Uh, and whether you use the Intel tools or not, some of the things that they're doing, uh, the reason they're doing it is they're trying to make it easier to do things that we see experts doing by hand. So if you don't use the Intel tools, you can still try to do these by hand. Now one of them is the advisor tool. And 
the advisor tool can help give hints about whether you should be doing data structure conversions, whether you should be using, uh, uh, there's a template library that can help with the data conversions, uh, how to use MCD RAM. These all come back to, uh, you can do, you can look at the compiler vector reports from Intel or other compilers, you can look at memory utilization using various tools, and you can kind of cobble this together. The vector advisor tries to bring it together in an automated fashion, and if they've done their job right, it makes it easier. If it doesn't, they've obfuscated it. I, I've had very good experiences personally with this tool, but um, the, understanding memory accesses uh, so that you can decide if you need to change your data layout is something you can do by hand. Um, another thing is uh, flop counting. <laughs> this one's really frustrating. It turns out on Intel architecture right now, this gets fixed in future things, like read that to be after Haswell and after Knight's landing. The, uh, you know, th this is like the most embarrassing question I ever get asked at Intel is how do I count flops? And we go, well, you can't with the hardware. And they're like, are you guys stupid? Well, yeah. The, the, the problem is that when we introduced AVX and AVX 512, we actually introduced masking operations. And you can turn on and off floating point operations. So sometimes the compiler will use an instruction and mask everything off except one. Other times it'll enter a loop and progressively turn them on and turn off lanes to do software pipelining in a more compact fashion. And so when you execute uh, as a uh, AVX instruction, you actually don't know how many floating point operations you're doing. And if you count it as 16 or eight every time, you will overcount flops. And guess what? Users actually know how many flops their code does quite a bit, and when we overcount it, they get mad. They go, why are you issuing extra operations? Well, we aren't actually. We just don't know how to count when the masks are turned off. Well, it turns out the, the vector advisor tool can, uh, uh, can intercede, and it slows your program down a little, but it can be mask aware. It can observe the mask and, and reduce the count. VTune can't do that right now. Future hardware will compensate for that, but that takes more transistors, and the architects didn't put the transistors into Haswell or into Knight's Landing, so the it's not mask aware. So it will overcount flops. There's a flop tool. You would think this would be easy, but it's not. It takes transistors. Um, and final thing that they've added is something called roofline analysis. And I talk about it a little in the book. I would love to see more papers written about this. Because as I go about, I realize everybody knows what a roofline analysis is, but nobody can describe to me how they do it exactly. Um, and it's because they don't, they're afraid of being embarrassed. So what a roofline analysis is, is you try to do a back of the envelope calculation for your app of how well it should do on a given architecture. And so the problem with that is you have to be estimating the right things. You have to realize if you're, if you're computationally bound, how many flops does your program take? And is it in the computationally bound part most of the time or only part of the time? So the easy thing is, is if I need to do a certain number of flops and I'm always computationally bound and that's my whole app, then the back of the envelope calculation is pretty easy. I divide by the, the, uh, uh, the flops I expect to get on the machine into the number of flops I want to do and I come up with how many seconds my program should run and I'm done. That's my estimate. The problem is with roofline analysis, usually programs are more complex. Like it spends half the time being computationally bound and half time this, and you do all these math. The idea is it's a good idea on paper to try to estimate what you think the performance of your app will be on a piece of hardware. And I think a lot of people miss doing that. But if you can figure out how on a piece of paper to sort of compute where you think it'll be, you have an advantage to the first thing I was saying about performance tuning, which is you should have an idea of what you're expecting so that when you go in with the tools that you know whether it matched your expectations or not. And then you can debug from there. If you go in not knowing what you're expecting, you're really missing out on a lot of what performance tools can help you with. So um, they have a roofline analysis tool built into Vector Advisor. Uh, now, um, it's very new. I know they would love feedback on it, but they're trying to get in there and help look at a program, characterize how often it's CPU bound, memory bound stuff, and come up with estimates of what they think the range of performance of the app can be. And keep in mind, it's looking at an app you've already, you're running, 
and observing it and thinking, wow, there might be some upside here. Maybe you can get more vectorization and it, it will give you an idea of what the upside might be. It can't promise you that you can get it, but it's trying to do what people often do on paper um, and it's well worth thinking about. I did have one other parting thought. Um, this one, the Cosmos folks. Uh, I mentioned them before. They did a lovely chapter in one of our Pearl's books, the volume two. And they, they take their example and they do nine different changes to their application. And the gray bar is Xeon Phi, the black bar is Xeon. They weren't even parallel at first. Step four, they made the program parallel. But they show how they speed the program up 120x. Um, and every change they, they show, they do things. And a lot of people look at step seven and say, James, would you tell me what step seven is? That looks pretty cool. Because that seems like a really important one to know. And I love this step because um, it wasn't adding pragma SIMD. It wasn't changing a data layout. It, it was an algorithm of change. They, they were doing an integration rule. They were calling an MKL function. And the MKL function was doing far more work than they needed. They figured out that they could actually write their own integration routine that didn't compute um, everything uh, to the same precision and so on, but they didn't need it. The, you know, the function called MKL worked brilliantly, except you were asking MKL to do more work than you needed to. And they reassessed it and they found an uh, integration root rule that was 10 times as fast. That's a, an algorithm change. And I'll let that be my last uh, parting thought, don't forget the algorithm. Spend all your time looking at how you can optimize the code in front of you. Take a deep breath and think about whether you could do a different algorithm and um, that'll, that'll, uh, 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 that can be a game changer. And I, I've seen that so often where people are working to optimize a piece of code so hard and someone else comes in and goes, oh, I know a different algorithm, boom, 10x. Uh, don't forget it. Uh, I would like to ask like that, the loop vectorization makes sense to me, right? But uh, how does the function vectorization work and what are the restrictions the function to be vectorized? Okay, so you said the, the, the load vectorizations made sense, but how does a function vectorization work? Um, and so the functions, um, the function that I showed had uh, pretty simple parameters. It was uh, uh, having a couple floats come in and a float come out. And vector instructions don't operate on one thing at a time. They work on like four or eight or 16 at a time. So uh, what a vector function means to the compiler is um, instead of assuming you're going to get uh, two single inputs and one single output, um, rewrite the function to do four times as much work or eight or 16 or actually the compiler may produce all three versions. Um, and then uh, when the function is called, the compiler also has to know at the time it's called that, that, that there might be vector versions available. So if, it, if the function is called at a time when it could pass four elements or eight elements, it'll pass eight elements to the eight version instead of calling the single version eight times. That's all. It's not, it's not super magical because the compiler has to know when, when you tell it that a function could be vectorized, it'll produce different versions of it and then at the place it's called, it'll also decide which one to call so that it can call the function less often. Uh, call it with more data but less often. That's all. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not super magical but it's very powerful because it can speed up a program. And it's most powerful if the function gets inlined because then the overhead of the function goes away too. So how large are these problems now when you're not uh, looking at C, but you're doing Portman, uh, which is a lot uh, stricter on uh, all the arguments you can handle? Fortran uh, tends to vectorize a lot more for two reasons. One is the language things, uh, and the other is that Fortran code has been often been around longer and it's probably run on vector machines before. Um, so your question was how often does it matter for Fortran versus C? So I see with Fortran that uh, Fortran code uh, that I see in general tends to vectorize more. Um, but um, uh, we still see issues with alignment or we see issues with uh, 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 striding through arrays. We, 
there still is definitely a lot of opportunity in Fortran code I've seen, but usually it's a lot, um, my experience, it's a lot easier to get the Fortran code to vectorize than it is uh, C code. It, it tends to be more straightforward to, to understand the code, its intent, and its intent usually isn't quite as wild as uh, C code, mostly because there aren't pointers, so you don't have, uh, the data structures are simpler, um, and that's usually easier to understand what to do. It is troublesome, though, the, the, um, if the data is in common blocks and things like that, sometimes you need to fuss with them a little to get them laid out to be aligned properly. Um, the newer processors from Intel, including Knight's Landing, are a lot more tolerant of misaligned data. Um, it used to be that uh, they'd have separate instructions for aligned versus misaligned, and the misaligned instructions could handle aligned data or misaligned. The, the aligned ones, if you were misaligned, would blow up. So the compiler would use misaligned ones when it wasn't sure, but they were always slower. On the, the more recent ones, the, the load instructions are the same speed, but you may still fetch two cache lines in order to get data that's misaligned, and it may slow your program down a little depending on it. So getting alignment can still boost, but not usually as much. Um, so things are getting better, because uh, that, that's one thing we'd fuss with in common blocks is you'd have a whole bunch of data in a common block and you'd want to get certain arrays aligned uh, to the right boundaries, and uh, you don't need to do that as much as you did on past processors, fortunately. <laughs>